Hi everybody. March 14, 2019. I want you to listen to just a few minutes of this video that was sent to me by a subscriber in the comment section. Thank you for sending this along. It's on Representative Press's channel. Venezuela facts you don't hear from the mainstream media. Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world. It is an abundance of other natural resources, gold, bauxite, coltan, but obviously a lot of these resources under the hands of the Maduro government are not easily accessible by US and transnational corporations. Much of the oil industry was nationalised in uh, 1973. And it's quite obvious that this latest coup attempt, because let's remember it's not the first or the only one, the latest coup attempt has been done to get the hands on Venezuelan oil. We're looking at the oil assets, that's the single most uh, important income stream to the government of Venezuela. We're looking at what to do to that. We want everybody to know we're, we're looking at all this very seriously. We don't want any American businesses or investors caught by surprise. They can see what President Trump did yesterday. We're following through on it. Look, we're in conversation with major American companies now that are either in Venezuela or in the case of Citgo here in the United States. Uh, I think we're trying to get to the same end result. It'll make a big difference to the United States economically if we could have American oil companies really invest in and, and produce the oil uh, capabilities in uh, Venezuela. The next passage down in the book has been, I think, ignored just by about everyone who's talked to you about it. The president says to the briefer that he wants to have a war with Venezuela, and this is in 2017. Yeah, the, pres <clears throat> the president's remarks to the room were along the lines of, I don't understand why we're not looking at Venezuela, why are we not at war with Venezuela, they have all the oil, and they're right on our back door. These were comments that caused us uh, deep concern. They were incredibly troubling. The United States was proud to be the first nation in the world to recognize President Guaido. And by the way, John Bolton is here. Where's he? Working hard. And I have to say, I felt absolutely sick listening to the points that Niall was making. It's not true to say that none of the opposition took part in the election. Some of them did, and some of them recognised its fairness after all. But to whinge about elections not being fair, and to support as an alternative somebody who assumed a position, who decided, couldn't be bothered standing in an election, comes along at the behest of their US puppet masters and says, do you know what, I'll be president. Well, Michael D. Higgins, the turnout in the presidential election in Ireland was 43%. In Venezuela, it was 46%. Do you think if I come along now and say, do you know what, I, Michael D. doesn't have a mandate, I'll be the president. Do we want Donald Trump to come in here and support that over the heads of the Irish people? Because where are the Venezuelan people? They're out on the streets in their millions saying, Yankee, go home. Yankee! They're saying hands off Venezuela. Okay, it's a very good video and I hope that you click on the link below to watch the entirety, which is just another 13 minutes uh, long. But I am going to be reading what is a really good article on the Gray Zone website. Max Blumenthal, uh, Blumenthal wow, uh, really drives it home. He's clearly an uh, investigative journalist, unlike our mainstream media. Well, what are they? They're uh, just reading their script. Four, our government to take over another country, Venezuela this time, the making of Juan Guaido, how the U.S. regime change laboratory created Venezuela's coup leader. leader. Before the fateful day of January 22nd, fewer than one in five Venezuelans had heard of Juan Guaido. It's kind of like that guy, um, Barack Obama, 
you know, when he came on the scene? Who is he? And mainstream media. Wow. They created a brand. Just like Juan Cueto is being created. And when you read this article, it is really uh, quite stunning. And uh, it's very long, but I'm going to read a lot of it. So if you don't like long videos, jump right on off. You can click on the link below, read it yourself. If you're not interested at all in some of the details and how Juan Guaido was created by Washington, D.C., well, uh, so long. I don't know what to say to you. Um, yeah, so only a few months ago, the 35-year-old was an obscure character in a politically marginal, far-right group closely associated with gruesome acts of street violence. Even in his own party, Guaido had been a mid-level figure in the opposition-dominated National Assembly, which is now held under contempt according to Venezuela's constitution. After a single phone call from U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, Guaido proclaimed himself president of Venezuela. Anointed as the leader of his country by Washington, D.C., a previously unknown political bottom dweller was vaulted onto the international stage as the U.S. selected leader of the nation with the world's largest oil reserves. You did hear John Bolton, right? You did hear him. You did hear this man being interviewed talking about Trump in 2017 who apparently uh, tried to get you know, uh, the military involved in the takeover of Venezuela. I guess the military said no. Um, why? In 2017, he was supposed to be making America great again. Why was he focusing on Venezuela? Oh, man, our presidents are selected. And then, they being the puppet of those behind the curtain, they recognize other presidents in countries that they select. I am so sick of our arrogance, our power, our power trips, our taking over, our entitlement in which we feel the United States can do whatever the hell it wants to do to other countries. I'm sick of it. But you did hear this guy, right? Mr. Neocon himself and Trump Oh, John Bolton is here. Hey, Johnny. How can Trump supporters who, quote-unquote, are awake, how did they support this guy? How, how do you sleep at night, Trump supporters, who you're about, you know, the truth and you're about being awake and all that? All right, John Bolton. Oh, it's going to uh, reap benefits for the U.S. economy? If we take over Venezuela, take over their oil reserves. I, I'm, yeah, it's clear. <laughs> and we could stop it. We could stop it. Yes, we do have the power. We have the numbers. We have the power. Unfortunately, most Americans don't want to do a thing to get involved in anything. Um, I don't want to see any further military action and you know what it may be happening so I want you to listen to just a few minutes of which video well you can watch the making of Guido actually um, on this newscast it's five minutes long it doesn't go into an awful lot of details which I'm gonna go into but here listen number of destabilization efforts are underway to ensure that significant pressure is put on President Maduro to step aside. In recent days, we have seen the most extensive power outage covering roughly 70 percent of the country. The communications minister of Venezuela, Jorge Rodriguez, was swift to point out that Marco Rubio knew in advance that an attack on the electrical grid was pending since he tweeted 
just a minute or two after the blackout began. So he said, alert, reports of complete power outage all across Venezuela at the moment. 18 of 23 states and the capital district are currently facing complete blackouts. Now, Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, was also swift to tweet the power outage and the devastation hurting ordinary Venezuelans is not because of the U.S., it is not because of Colombia, it is not because of Ecuador or Brazil, Europe or anywhere else. Power shortages and starvation are the result of Maduro's regime's incompetence, he wrote. Then he quickly followed up to say, no food, no medicine, no power, next, no Maduro. Now that Juan Guaido, the president of the National Assembly, is back in the country. He is agitating for intervention, he says, according to the Venezuela's Constitution, Article 187, he has the right to invite and authorize foreign military missions within the country. Let's listen. I believe that there's a section in the Constitution where you could ask for military help. But my question is, will you ask for it? Yes, that is part of Article 187 of our National Constitution, which is not only for Venezuela, but it allows for an outside country to cooperate or to assist Venezuela in this sense. As we've uh, stated in this article of our Constitution, which empowers me as the person in charge to employ whatever measures are necessary to enact this cooperation and this assistance for Venezuela. So, Juan Guaido is about to invite foreign military assistance into Venezuela. You can listen to this broadcast and find out how, well, Juan Guaido was instructed to say that from Pence, Trump, Pompeo, Rubio, who the hell knows? All right. Um, and that was today, by the way. So things are yeah, the destabilization efforts continue uh, at the blackout, as far as I know, continues. That was an act of war to bring down the electric grid in Venezuela. Um, and whether or not Trump will then say, oh, Juan, oh, you're inviting us in. Let's go in. Remains to be seen, but the American people can head it off if they demand some, I don't know, uh, righteousness, uh, demand, uh, you know, Trump, hey, Trump supporters, why don't you get on it and demand that he do the right thing? Oh, boy. All right. Well, yeah, that was that single phone call from Mike Pence. And then soon after, Guido, I'm the president. Then soon after, Trump. I recognize you as the president. Then soon after, hey, we got a lot of countries that are recognizing you as the president. Therefore, that's why Juan Guaido says, I'm in charge. Okie dokie. Um, if anybody did that to our country, Americans would be up in arms. Or maybe not. Maybe they're just so now apathetic that they could care less. What happens to them? We are suicidal, by the way. There is a collective suicidal ideation that has kind of taken over our population. Uh, and it took over years and years. It took over, actually, very, very shortly after 9-11-2001, uh, when the American people just didn't care uh, that, um, yeah, take away our rights, take away the Constitution to preserve the Constitution and our rights. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, anointed as the leader of his country by Washington, a previously unknown political bottom dweller was vaulted onto the international stage as the U.S. selected leader of the nation with the world's largest oil reserves. Guaido seemed to have materialized out of nowhere 
He was, in fact, the product of more than a decade of assiduous grooming by the U.S. government's elite regime change factories. Alongside a cadre of right-wing student activists, Guaido was cultivated to undermine Venezuela's socialist-oriented government, destabilize the country, and one day seize power. Though he has been a minor figure in Venezuelan politics, he had spent years quietly demonstrating his worthiness in Washington's halls of power. Juan Guaido is a character that has been created for this circumstance that from an Argentinian sociologist and leading chronicler of Venezuelan politics. He said, it's the logic of a laboratory. Guaido is like a mixture of several elements that create a character who, in all honesty, oscillates between laughable and worrying. Another uh, Venezuelan journalist and writer for the investigative outlet Mission Verdad agreed. He said, Guaido is more popular outside Venezuela than inside, especially in the elite Ivy League and Washington circles. Guaido is today sold as the face of democratic restoration, yet he spent his career in the most violent faction of Venezuela's most radical opposition party, positioning himself at the forefront of one destabilization campaign after another. His party has been widely discredited inside Venezuela. Um, these radical leaders have no more than 20% in opinion polls. And that was written or spoken by a Venezuela's, Venezuela's leading pollster. Uh, according to Leon, he's the pollster, Guaido's party remains isolated because the majority of the population does not want war. What they want is a solution. This is precisely why Guaido was selected by Washington. He is not expected to lead Venezuela toward democracy, but to collapse a country that for the past two decades has been a bulwark of resistance to U.S. hegemony. Since the 1998 election of Hugo Chavez, the United States has fought to restore control over Venezuela and its vast oil reserves. Chavez's socialist programs may have redistributed the country's wealth and helped lift millions of people out of poverty, but they also earned him a target on his back. The Trump administration immediately elevated Venezuela to the top of Washington's regime change target list, branding it the leader of a troika of tyranny. The U.S. was also involved in a plot codenamed Operation Constitution to capture Maduro at the Miraflores uh, Presidential Palace and another called Operation Armageddon to assassinate him at a military parade in July 2017. Just over a year later, exiled opposition leaders tried and failed to kill Maduro with drone bombs during a military parade in Caracas. More than a decade before these intrigues, a group of right-wing opposition students were hand-selected and groomed by an elite U.S.-funded regime change training academy to topple Venezuela's government and restore the neoliberal order. October 5, 2005, with Chavez's popularity at its peak and his government planning, sweeping socialist programs, five Venezuelan student leaders arrived in Belgrade, Serbia, to begin training for an insurrection. Students had arrived from Venezuela courtesy of the Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies, or CANVAS. This group is funded largely through the National Endowment for Democracy, a CIA cutout that functions as the U.S. government's main arm of promoting regime change. Canvas is a spin-off of Akpor, a Serbian protest group um, and 
you can read you can click on the link below and read what I'm leaving out but I wanted to capture uh, what I feel is the most important to get the point across guys this is all orchestrated from Washington DC the small cell of regime change specialists was operating according to the theories of the late Gene Sharp the so-called Clausewitz of nonviolent struggle Sharp had worked with former Defense Intelligence Agency analyst Robert Helvey to conceive a strategic blueprint that weaponized protest as a form of hybrid warfare, aiming it at states that resisted Washington's unipolar domination. Can you imagine living your life? This is your career, taking down countries, uh, you, you, and these people must know that, by the way, oh yes, the communist fist. Um, these people must know that they cause so much suffering and clearly they just don't care. Wow! This is how you live your life. Mm. Uphor was supported by the National Endowment for Democracy, USAID, and Sharp's Albert Einstein Institute. Akpour's main trainers once said the group even received direct CIA funding. According to a leaked email from Stratfor staffer, after running, um, sorry, after running Milosevic out of power, the kids who ran Akpour grew up, got suits, and designed Canvas. Or, in other words, an export a revolution group that sowed the seeds for a number of color revolutions. These are not organic revolutions. They are orchestrated and funded very often by people like George Soros, organizations like USAID, your tax dollars go to toppling countries. Um, yeah canvas or in other words export a revolution group that sowed the seeds for a number of color revolutions they are still hooked into u.s funding and basically go around the world trying to topple dictators and autocratic governments ones that the u.s does not like stratfor revealed that canvas turned its attention to venezuela in 2005 after training opposition movements that led pro-NATO regime change operations across Eastern Europe. While monitoring the Canvas training program, Stratfor outlined its insurrectionist agenda in strikingly blunt language. Listen to this. Success is by no means guaranteed, and student movements are only at the beginning of what could be a years-long effort to trigger a revolution in Venezuela, but the trainers themselves are the people who cut their teeth on the butcher of the Balkans. Yes, Serbia. They've got um, and I cannot think of the name of another country. Okay sorry brain going um, success is by no means guaranteed students movements have, they've cut their teeth on the butcher of the Balkans they've got mad skills when you see students at five Venezuelan universities hold simultaneous demonstrations you will know that the training is over and the real work has begun the real work began two years later in 2007 when Guaido graduated from um, Andres Bello Catholic University of Caracas. Jesuit, maybe? Hmm. He moved to Washington, D.C. to enroll in the governance and political management program at George Washington University under the tutelage of Venezuelan economist Louis Enrique Berizzi of Tisha, I don't know, one of the top Latin American neoliberal economists. He 
a former executive director of the International Monetary Fund, who spent more than a de decade working in the Venezuelan energy sector under the old oligarchic regime that was ousted by Chavez. Guaido helped lead anti-government rallies after the Venezuelan government declined to renew the license of Radio Caracas Television. This privately owned station played a leading role in the 2002 coup against Chavez. RCTV helped mobilize anti-government demonstrators, falsified information blaming government supporters for acts of violence carried out by opposition members, and they're still doing it, and banned pro-government reporting amid the coup. From the protests around RCTV and the referendum, a specialized cadre of U.S.-backed class of regime change activists was born. They called themselves Generation 2007. The Stratfor and Canvas trainers of this cell identified Guido's ally, a libertarian political organizer, let's just call him Jan, as a key factor in defe uh, defeating the constitutional referendum. He was re rewarded for his efforts with the Cato Institute's Milton Freedom Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty, along with a half a million dollar check, which he promptly invested into his political network. A 2007 email from American Ambassador to Venezuela, William Brownfield, sent to the State Department, National Security Council, Department of Defense Southern Command praised Generation 2007 for having forced the Venezuelan president, accustomed to setting the political agenda, to overreact. Flush with cash from libertarian oligarchs and the U.S. government soft power outfits, the radical Venezuelan cadre took their octopore tactics to the streets along with a version of the group's logo. Yes. Okay. Um, 2009. The Generation 2007 youth activists staged their most provocative demonstration yet, dropping their pants on public roads and aping the outrageous guerrilla theater tactics outlined by Gene Sharp in his regime change manuals. Another newfangled youth group called Jabu, uh, this far-right group, gathered funds from a variety of U.S. government sources, which allowed it to gain notoriety quickly as the hardline wing of opposition street movements. While video of the protest is not available, they're dropping their pants. Many Venezuelans have identified Guido as one of its key... This is Guido. This is the guy who said, okay, I'll follow your commands. I'm the president of Venezuela. Yeah. While the allegation is unconfirmed that this is Guido, it is certainly plausible. The bare buttocks protesters were members of the Generation 2007 inner core that Guido belonged to. So, Guaido exposed himself to the public in another way, founding a political party to capture the anti-Chavez energy his Generation 2007 had cultivated, called Popular Will. It was led by um, Leopoldo Lopez, a Princeton-educated right-wing firebrand heavily involved in national endowment for democracy programs and elected as mayor of a district in Caracas that was one of the wealthiest in the country. Lopez was a portrait of Venezuelan aristocracy, er, um, aristocracy directly descended from his country's first president. All right, 2010 popular will and its foreign backers moved to exploit the worst drought to hit Venezuela in decades. Was it manufactured by man? Well, perhaps. Massive electricity shortages had struck the country due to the dearth of water, 
which was needed to power hydroelectric plants. A global economic recession and declining oil prices compounded the crisis, driving public discontent. Stratfor and Canvas, key advisors of Guaido and his anti-government cadre, devised a shockingly cynical plan to drive a dagger through the heart of the Bolivarian Revolution. The scheme hinged, ready? The scheme hinged on a 70% collapse of the country's electrical system by as early as April 2010. Well, gee, we just had a collapse of electricity in Venezuela. This is what was outlined. This was taken from the plan. Quote, this could be the watershed event as there is little that Chavez can do to protect the poor from the failure of that system. The Stratfor internal memo declared. This would likely have the impact of galvanizing public unrest in a way that no opposition group could ever hope to generate. At that point in time, an opposition group would be best served to take advantage of the situation and spin it against Chavez and towards their needs. So, speed up to 2019 and you've got Venezuela, their grid down, power outages all over, but they're not spinning it against Chavez, they're spinning it against Maduro. By this point, the Venezuelan opposition was receiving a staggering 40 to 50 million a year from U.S. government organizations like USAID and the National Endowment for Democracy. November 2010, according to emails obtained by Venezuelan security sources, Guaido and his ally, uh, Jan, and several of the student activists attended a secret five-day training at a hotel dubbed Fiesta Mexicana Hotel in Mexico. The sessions were run by Akpur Belgrade-based regime change trainers backed by the U.S. government. The email stated Guaido and his fellow activists hatched a plan to overthrow Chavez by generating chaos through protracted spasms of street violence. And three of Venezuelan's petroleum industry figureheads paid the tab, 52,000. Uh, you can read about uh, these figureheads that were part of the opposition <clears throat> to get rid of Chavez. And in May 2014, Caracas released documents detailing an assassination plot against Maduro. The leaks identified the anti-Chavez hardliner uh, Maria Corina Machado. Machado. Uh, today, the main asset of Rubio, Marco Rubio, as a leader of the scheme. And here she is with President Bush. Oh boy. Venezuelans, hang on to your country. Keep fighting. Oh, the evil empire. Please, don't let us win. I think it is time to gather efforts, make the necessary calls, and obtain financing to annihilate Maduro, and the rest will fall apart. That was what she wrote to a former Venezuelan diplomat, Diego Aria, in 2014. Machado, I'm not sure, uh, Machado, uh, bad, bad, bad am I with pronouncing names. Okay. Machado claimed that the violent plot had the blessings of U.S. Ambassador to Colombia, Kevin Whitaker. That February, student demonstrators acting as shock troops for that uh, exiled oligarchy erected violent barricades across the country, turning opposition control quarters into violent fortresses known as uh, Guadarimbes. Yeah. 
while international media portrayed the upheaval as a spontaneous protest against Maduro's iron-fisted rule, there was ample evidence that popular will, Guaido's party, popular will was orchestrating the show. Uh, asked who the ringleaders were, uh, a participant in these riots, well, if I am totally honest, those guys are legislators now. So three years later, they erupted again. They had, in 2014, 43 were killed. Three years later, they erupted again, causing mass destruction of public infrastructure, the murder of government supporters, and the deaths of 126 people, many of whom were Chavistas. Several cases, in several cases, supporters of the government were burned alive by armed gangs. Our mainstream media flips around that and claims that it's Maduro killing uh, opposition, the freedom fighters in Venezuela. Guaido was directly involved in the 2014 riots. In fact, he tweeted a video showing himself clad in a helmet and gas masks surrounded by masked and armed elements that had shut down a highway that were engaging in a violent clash with the police alluding to his participation in Generation 2007, he proclaimed, I remember in 2007 we proclaimed, students, now we shout, resistance, resistance, there is Mr. Resistance, Mr. U.S. Puppet, who is expendable, so if, if we get our way, the U.S. will so not care about you as long as you continue to do what the United States wants you to do. In 2016, Guaido's dismissed deaths resulting from um, Guayas, Guayas, uh, it's a tactic involving stretching steel wire across a roadway in order to injure or kill motorcyclists. As a myth, that's what Guaido dismissed it as, a myth. His comments whitewashed a deadly tactic that had killed unarmed civilians like Santiago Pedrosa and decapitated a man named Elvis Duran, among many others. This callous disregard of human life would define his popular will party in the eyes of much of the public, including many opponents of Maduro. You got to get a sick, twisted dude that will do your sick, twisted bidding. And that's Guaido. As violence and political polarization escalated across the country, the government began to act against the popular will leaders who helped stoke it. So you can read those leaders of this popular will party, uh, how they were jailed, then put on house arrest, many escaped to uh, other countries. Many even went to Washington, D.C. So, uh, you can read more about... It's amazing. It's so... It, oh, God. This guy, um, Shum... Shumilansky. He was a member of the original Otpor trained generation 2007. He became Venezuela's youngest, youngest ever mayor when he was elected in 2013 in this alf, affluent suburb, El Petitalio. I don't know. He was stripped of his position and sentenced to 15 months in prison by the Supreme Court after it found him culpable of stirring the violent riots. Facing arrest, he shaved his beard, donned, donned um, sunglasses, slipped into Brazil, disguised as a priest with a Bible in hand and rosary around his neck. He now lives in Washington, D.C. And who does he buddy up with? None other than Elliot Abrams. Abrams, who is notorious 
4. Overseeing the U.S. covert policy of arming right-wing death squads in the 1980s in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala. His lead role in the Venezuelan coup has stoked fears that another blood-drenched proxy war might be on the way. Yeah. And this guy sleeps perfectly fine. Disgusting, despicable people. All right. Um, yep, 40 minutes. Um, you'll read how, well, <laughs> there, there was none other than Guido left in this popular will. You know, he had like this, like secondhand, you know, um, power position in a very, very small party in the National Assembly. But because so many of the popular will legislators were escaping their arrests for the violence that they had caused in Venezuela or on house arrest after being jailed, who was left to head the popular will party? Guaido, hailing from one of Venezuela's least populous states, Guaido came in second place during a 2015 parliamentary election, winning just 26 of 26 percent of votes in order to secure his place in the National Assembly. Guaido is known as the president of the opposition-dominated National Assembly, but he was never elected to that position. The four opposition parties that comprise the Assembly's Democratic Unity Table had decided to establish a rotating presidency of that party, popular will's turn was on the way, but its founder, Lopez, was under house arrest. Uh, meanwhile, his second in charge, Guevara, uh, had taken refuge in the Chilean embassy. Oh, Juan Guaido was selected. Um, Guaido has common features, like most Venezuelans do, and seems more like a man of the people. Also, he, he had not been overexposed in the media, so he could be built up to pretty much anything. Then they went about uh, destroying all the information that would have um, turned Venezuelans against him. Um, and yeah, we've got uh, Senator Marco Rubio, Senator Rick Scott, Mario Diaz, representative, Mario Diaz Balwart, all lawmakers from the Florida base of the right wing Cuban exile lobby joined President Trump and Vice President Pence at the White House uh, a week later, a week uh, sometime in December 2018. Um, <laughs> at their request, Rubio, Scott, uh, Mario Diaz Balwart. Uh, at their request, Trump agreed that if Guaido declared himself president, he would back him. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo met personally with Guaido on January 10. Um, it's so obvious, it's so clear. What are we doing, Americans, just sitting back and letting this go on? Yeah. Guido, uh, Wikipedia had changed, you know, its page 37 times regarding Guido. Uh, they put their elite um, people in charge, their elite council of librarians in charge of his page to make sure that all of the lies were right out there on Wikipedia. Uh, Guaido might have been an obscure figure, but his combination of radicalism and opportunism satisfied Washington's needs. That internal piece was missing. A Trump administration set up Guaido. He was the piece we needed for our strategy to be coherent and complete. For the first time, Brownfield, that former American ambassador to Venezuela, gushed to the New York Times. You have an opposition leader who is clearly signaling to the armed forces and to law enforcement that he wants to keep them on the side of the angels and with the good guys. 
But Guido's popular will party formed the shock troops of the riots that caused the deaths of police officers and common citizens alike. He had been uh, boasted, he had even boasted, Guido had boasted of his own participation in the street riots, and now, to win the hearts and minds of the military and police, Guido had to erase his blood-soaked history. On January 21, a day before the coup began, in earnest, Guido's wife delivered a video address calling on the military to rise up against Maduro. While Guido waits on direct assistance, he remains what he has always been, a pet project of cynical outside forces, it doesn't matter if he crashes and burns after all these misadventures to the Americans. He is expendable. Alrighty then. Fabulous article. And uh, more details on <laughs> the orchestrated overthrow of another country. And I'm sorry, Trump supporters. You've lost my respect. Done. Done. Way too much evidence that your guy is so just like all the rest. A sick psychopathic puppet who cares about nothing but getting the job done. You really think he's going to make America great again? You really think these people care about you? Please. Stop being so naive.